All right, well, good morning and welcome uh, to all of you watching at home because we have an empty church this morning uh, due to the, uh, the issue with the coronavirus. So uh, welcome and uh, good to be with you. So glad uh, to spend this, mo this time with you and uh, to examine God's word together this morning. So we're going to continue on in our sermon series in Malachi. Now, last week we ended with verse 16, and there's still one more verse to get to from chapter 2. And so we're going to look at verse 17 this morning. And there's a reason that I, that I, that I set aside this verse uh, to just look at individually. Because it's a very important verse with a lot of very important implications for uh, not just our own lives, but really the, the state of uh, this country that, that we live in. And it's very interesting as we, as we begin to break it down and look at it. And so I'm just going to read verse 17 from chapter 2 and then kind of give you some background before we jump into uh, the things that I want to discuss this morning. And, and really, this sermon took a, a turn, so to speak, uh, from where I was headed in the early part of the week. Actually, my outline um, looks very different from where I ended up as I spent time praying and going over this sermon. And uh, I'll tell you where that took a turn uh, and when we get to it a little later. But Malachi chapter 2, verse 17 says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, How have we wearied him? In that, you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Or, where is the justice of God? Now, over the past several weeks, we've looked at how our view of God directly affects our actions, our outward actions, the things that we do. The, how we view the Lord is, is, is very, very important to how we obey his commands, his statutes, really how we follow his religion, whether or not we are true followers or actually we are treating his religion with contempt. Your actions will show that. Are you growing weary of obedience? Do you look at your obedience to God as a burden, so to speak? And really, that was what was happening among the priests of Israel of Malachi's day. Their, their burden was actually obedience to God, a very sad state for any of us to be in. But the inverse of this is also true. If we have a right view of God, if we view him as, as, as holy, as, as, a, as a God to be honored, to be served, a, a God of, of love, but also a God of righteousness and justice, then we will view our service to God as a reasonable act of obedience, a reasonable response out of the love that he showed us. Obedience to his call and commands in our life won't be a burden if we view God properly. And if we understand what he's done for us properly, it will be a delight. And that is the, the difference that I want all of us to try to consider this morning in our own lives. Do you view God and his call on your life and his commands for you to walk in his statutes? Do you view that as a burden or do you view that as a delight that you get to serve the God of creation? I hope all of us view it that way. Because as we saw last week, our outward actions really are the true test of our faith. The old saying that talk is cheap really is a true statement, isn't it? But for the priests of Israel up to this point, God still hasn't gotten through to them. We've looked at a series of indictments that God has brought to the priests that actually Malachi has brought on behalf of God to the priests. And each time that Malachi has brought these indictments against this nation, against the priests of this nation, they've, they've really responded to God in defiance. They've questioned God. Think of the questions that they've asked him up to this point. They've asked God, how have you really loved us? How have we despised your name? For what reason have we lost your favor? And then in verse 17, it's no different. What's the question they ask God? How have we wearied you? How have we wearied you? And guess what? God wastes no time, does he? He wastes no time in answering his question. This question, rather. He says in verse 17, You have wearied the Lord with your words. First, I want to address something of great importance this morning. And it's one of the reasons I left verse 17 as a standalone verse that we could, we could begin to break down uh, together this week as opposed to covering parts of it last week. I don't think we often consider God 
or consider the fact, rather, that God can become weary. He's all-powerful, right? He's almighty. He's the creator of the universe. What could possibly be wearisome to God? Well, the answer, of course, is sin. The Bible is clear that the sins of mankind is a constant source of weariness or burden for the Lord. Let's look at Isaiah 43, 24. You have bought me not sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you have burdened me with your sins, says the Lord. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Amos 2, verse 13. Behold, I am weighted down beneath you as a wagon is weighted down when filled with sheaves. And the Lord is addressing the sins of Israel when he says that through the prophet of Amos. Now, this isn't a weariness that means that God cannot bear the weight, as in he is too weak to bear the weight of sin. That's not it at all, actually. The, the Hebrew word here actually carries the meaning that he refuses to bear the sin. He refuses to bear the weight of it. He will not put up with, with it forever. Actually, the, the, the probably the most um, accurate phrase in the, in the English language would be that God is fed up with sin. That's the kind of weariness, weariness that we're talking about here. Not that he can't bear it, that he won't bear it forever. There will come a time when God will deal with sin appropriately and completely. All of creation is on an inescapable crash course with judgment before the throne of God. And we're going to get to that more on that later. But the response of the, that the priests give us, give us insight to the pervasiveness of the sin that was in their own lives and how it had darkened their hearts. You see, it, it had not only corrupted their view of God, it had not only corrupted their actions, but it had obscured the truth from their very minds. Their thinking became futile. And when your thinking becomes futile and foolish, and then the words we speak become corrupted as well. Actually, the, in the book of James, chapter 2, we're told all about that. That what is in the heart, the condition of our heart, will come out of our mouths. It will corrupt our words. And that's what God's indictment against the priest was from our text this morning. They, they are wearying God with their words. Not just their sinful actions, but their actual sinful words. And this is so important when we consider the sin that seeks to take root in our own lives. Left unchecked, it will corrupt you to the very core of your being. Left unchecked, it will darken your heart to the point that your thoughts on everything will become perverted, skewed, foolish. And there's a section in the book of Romans that we're going to look at later that talks about that exact thing. You see, sin is not just something that, 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 that we can allow to come and go, so to speak, in our life, that we can take lightly. Because if we don't deal with it appropriately, if we don't cast that thing from us, sin has the power to corrupt us to our very, very core. And we need to be very considerate of that this morning. But because sin had penetrated to the hearts of the priests, this became their view of God. And this ought to bring into light, into focus, the corruption that sin does to us. It doesn't just change our actions, but it changes our very view of the truth and perverts it and twists it. This became what the priests of Israel thought about God. Think about this. They said this, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Can you imagine coming to that conclusion, being that perverted in your mind that that is the conclusion that you come to? Or they continue on with this indictment against the Lord. Where is the God of justice? Now, there are two accusations made here against the Lord. Both of these accusations need some context. Remember, Israel is still a people under the oppressive rule of a foreign nation. The Persians were, were, the, were, the pe were a people that were steeped in idolatry, in pagan rituals. They were wicked, they were immoral, they were ungodly, really in every way imaginable. And yet, they were the most prosperous and powerful nation on the earth at the time 
of this writing. They were strong in military might. They possessed all that is considered good in the eyes of the world. All that is considered good is in the eyes of the world. And in comparison, Israel was a nation that was destitute. They were poor. They were in want of even basic needs. They were mocked by the surrounding nations. And if you read through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you can see some of that mockery that was brought to them. They were the joke of the Middle East, so to speak. They didn't even have their own national sovereignty. And to them, this all seemed so unfair. How could a wicked nation prosper when in their minds they knew the true God and yet he had abandoned them? That was their thinking. God had abandoned them while he had prospered the wicked Persians and really all the nations that surrounded them. And because of this, the temptation to view worldly prosperity as a sign of the favor of God proved far too tempting for the priests of Israel. They couldn't resist it. And so they, they accused God. They accused God of loving the wicked of the world. And really what it was, it was, it was a malicious attack against the very character of God himself. This is basically what they were saying. They said, we were wrong about you, Lord. We, we were wrong. We thought you loved righteousness. We thought you loved people who walked upright before you. But apparently, apparently you actually love the wicked. Apparently, you actually love those who do evil and delight in them. Because look, look how you've prospered this wicked nation. That was really what they were saying when they questioned the Lord, or when they answered the Lord, rather, from verse 17. Persia's wealth and worldly gain was proof in their eyes, in their twisted minds, of God's favor. Their sin had corrupted their view, both of what was pleasing to God and the proofs of God's favor. Well, today, nothing has really changed much. There are entire denominations that base their thinking on this same principle. That wealth, health, prosperity, that these things are the fruits of God's favor in the life of a Christian. This false idea that if God loves you, he will lavish riches upon you is, is nothing new. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. And yet it's pervasive among many so-called Christian churches, entire denominations in this culture. We look at the Joel Osteens of the world, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland. They all preach this type of a, uh, of a false gospel, a defiled version of what the favor of God looks like. There are entire uh, denominations like the, the New Apostolic Revelation Movement or the Pentecostal churches, many of them. They teach this same heresy that, that the priests of Malachi's day taught, that if God loves you, he will, he will uh, pour his riches, not his riches, he will pour worldly riches out upon you. And that somehow that is a sign of God's favor in your life. Now, this was a bad enough accusation against God and a bad enough uh, way of thinking. And if you think that today, if you think that, that, that favor in your life from God will look like money and riches, then you've been listening to the wrong voice. And, and I, I urge you this morning to reconsider what God's favor actually looks like. And we're going to get to that in a moment. But this was a bad enough accusation against the Lord to, to say this about God, that he delights in the wicked. And yet they didn't stop there. They also went on to say this gem before the Lord. They said, where is the God of justice? So what are they saying here? What do they mean by this? What are the priests really accusing the Lord of? Well, they're saying this. They're saying, Lord, you must delight in wicked, in the wickedness of, of men. You must delight in that. Because if it's not true that you delight in the wicked, then why haven't you destroyed the Persians yet? Why haven't you brought them to justice? Why haven't you condemned their sin and destroyed this nation? That's what they were asking the Lord. Now, there are very two, uh, two very big problems, rather, with this line of thinking. Two very big problems. First, it showed the absolute self-righteousness of these priests. Can you imagine? These priests disobeyed God in every way imaginable. Right? They defiled his altar, the Lord, the Lord said. They despised him. They taught from his word in a false manner. They misrepresented the word of the Lord. 
They dealt treacherously with their neighbors. They brought idol-worshiping wives into the house of God, all the while divorcing their current wives in order to do so. And they had the nerve to say that if God was truly a God of justice, he would destroy those wicked Persians. They were so self-righteous that they actually overlooked their multitude, their mountain of sin before the Lord and pointed the finger at someone else. Talk about your classic example of removing the plank or the log from your own eye before you try to remove the speck from your brother's. But even more than this, and this could be the most sickening aspect of their sinful hearts before the Lord, they used God's mercy, his grace, his love, his patience, his long-suffering as a weapon against God. They threw it back in his face, so to speak, and they said, how dare you show mercy to a people who we don't think deserve it? Show us mercy, Lord, but not them. Where is the God of justice? That was their question. And can you believe the priests actually asked God, how have we wearied you? God brought this indictment against them. And he said, and, and they said, how have we wearied you? Can you imagine? <laughs> so brothers and sisters, church, what does this have to do with us? That's the question this morning. Because it does us no good just to look at the priests that have come before us or anyone really that's come before us. We have to examine ourselves this morning. And I wish that this really didn't have anything to do with us, but I, I think it has more to do with us than we care to admit. And this is where the direction of this sermon took kind of a sharp turn this week. I had a conversation this week concerning the hysteria that's going on worldwide, but really in our country now, in the United States of America, uh, the hysteria that's surrounding this coronavirus. And the question that was presented to me this week was, could this be the beginning of God's judgment? on the United States of America. And I thought about that question quite a bit this week. I thought about that word judgment. Judgment. Now, why would God judge a nation that loves him and honors him so much? I mean, that's the prevailing thought of most Christians in the United States of America, isn't it? At least many of them that I talk to. That the United States is a, is, a, is, a, is a nation that loves the Lord and that honors him and that his favor has been poured out on this nation. That's the prevailing sentiment among Christians. And maybe that's the prevailing sentiment in your mind when you think about this nation. That America is a Christian nation that brings honor to God. Now don't answer this question right away. How many of you, when you think of the United States of America, you think that same thing, that you view this country as a nation that has found favor with the Lord? Most Christians would say America is blessed by God. I've even seen book titles in Christian bookstores that say the same thing. But why? Why would we think that? Why do we think that? What is the proof of that? Or maybe, what's the proof against that? Well, one of your proofs might be that America is a wealthy nation. And I've heard that, I've heard that before. That America must love, or God must love America because look how wealthy we are. And we sure do have a lot of wealth, don't we? And therefore, according to that line of thinking, well, we must have favor with the Lord. But what does Psalm 52, 6 through 7 say about wealth? It says this, the righteous will see in fear. And we'll laugh at him, saying, Behold, the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, and yet was strong in his evil desire. Proverbs 11.28 says this, He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Does God bless those who are rich? Or does God bless those who are righteous? Good question to ask. Matthew 6, 24. This is Jesus. He says, he says this during the Sermon on the Mount. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Actually, I found no fewer than 54 verses in Scripture that speak of wealth not as a blessing, 
but as a stumbling block, block and a distraction, listen, from living righteously before the Lord. An actual stumbling block. So can the fact that America is wealthy be a sign of God's favor? Maybe, as Amer maybe America is good to you or has found favor before the Lord in your eyes because we have more freedoms to do as we please in this country. Does that make America good though? What I want to do this morning is I want to look at America, this country, from the eyes of God. And this is what I believe God sees when he looks at the United States of America as a nation. I don't think he sees righteousness. I think he sees wickedness. It is legal to murder babies here in America. Actually, we've murdered over 65 million of them just in the last roughly 50 years. America, on average, produces over 90% of the world's pornography. Right here in the good old U.S. of A., we produce 90% of the world's pornography. On average, 85% of all males in this country view it, and listen to this, nearly 50% of all females in this country view pornography. It's condoned, legal, and celebrated to commit sodomy in this country. In every depraved homosexual act is celebrated in the United States of America. It's even legal for homosexuals to defile the marriage covenant in marriage bed. Our institutions of education are evolutionary propaganda machines. They hate God and all he stands for, from kindergarten, I would say preschool, all the way up through our universities. Our public school system hates God and rejects his righteousness and righteous living. Our government makes a habit of assassinating and replacing leaders throughout the world, starting wars to make other countries follow the, the type of government that we, have that we have deemed best. We have literally killed foreign leaders and started wars if they weren't willing to do what we tell them to. We celebrate and participate in premarital sex, cohabitation, out of wedlock births. In America, money is our God and sin is what we are obedient to. But even more shocking than this, which these statistics would be shocking enough, but even more shocking than this, let's take a look at what those who attend church in this country believe about God and about faith in him. Right now, this very morning, Sunday morning, in the United States of America, there are churches throughout this country that preach a false gospel, a watered-down version of Christianity that are defaming, defiling, and debasing the truth of God's word at this very moment. And the results are in, brothers and sisters. In a recent Barna Research study, nearly 70% of Americans identify, self-identify as Christian. And here are the values of these so-called Christians. 76% of Christians in this country, and I use that term lightly, Christians in this country, say that the best way to find truth is to look within yourself. 76% of Christians in this country say, according to Barna, a, a study that, uh, that, that took into account 22,000 individuals, 76% said the best way to find truth is to look within yourself. 71% believe it is, listen, morally acceptable to spread a lie about someone who has offended or hurt you. 71% believe it's morally acceptable to spread a lie about someone who has offended you or hurt you. 60% of professing Christians in this country believe sex before marriage is, listen, morally acceptable. 45% believe having an abortion is morally acceptable. 42% believe that same-sex marriage is morally acceptable and actually God-honoring, God-honoring. 40% believe pornography is morally acceptable. Now, these are just a few of the statistics that I saw this week that were just shocking. These are professing Christians, professing Christians in this country. That's the belief system. That's the belief system. 
After I read that this week and read that report, that, 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 that scripture verse from the book of Judges came to mind. Judges 21, 25 is actually where it's found. And it says this, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And listen, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Isn't that, the, isn't that what we're living in in America this day? Isn't that the type of morality that America upholds, that everyone does what is right in their own eyes. But that stats told another terrifying reality. In asking millennial Christians what was the most important thing in their life as they continue to grow up and seek to have a family and all these different things, there's a bunch of options given to them. 66% of millennial Christians said the most important thing to them was to get a good education and a good paying job. Number one, these were professing Christians. Their number one goal in life was to get a good education and make money. Number one goal, almost 70%, over two-thirds of the upcoming generation. And listen, just 6% of millennial Christians said the most important thing to them was to mature in their faith and live a life pleasing to God. 6% said that was the most important thing to them. Parents, there is nothing of greater importance than the spiritual growth of our children. And in this country, for generations, Christian parents have placed education and wealth as the primary pinnacle of earthly achievement in the lives of their children. They've, we've devoted our lives to this education system so that, that, that our children can make money. We have traded their souls, so to speak, for a bowl of soup, if I can take a reference from Jacob and Esau. If you have young children this morning, the only thing of lasting importance is his or her soul. That's it. What does the Bible tell us? The Bible says, seek ye first God's kingdom in his righteousness, and God will take care of the rest. I don't care what my kids do for a living when they grow up. I could care less as long as they follow Christ. And brothers and sisters, we need to have that sentiment in our own lives as well as we think about our own children. We live in a time where everyone does what is right in his own eyes. Think about those shocking statistics we just looked at. In the state of this country, I would say the true state of this country. And yet, think about it. We often say God loves America and is pleased with America and that his favor is upon this country. I hear that so often among Christian communities. If we say that, then aren't we really saying that God delights in sin and prospers the wicked? Are we no different than the priests of Israel's day? If we say that God loves America and his favor is upon us, and yet we look at what America practices, the prevailing views in this country, then we must be saying that God loves wickedness, that God delights in those who practice wickedness. I want to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 31, and I understand this is a long section of scripture. And so... Open up your Bibles, please, with me to Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Now, this is a very familiar passage to many of us. But we can't miss this this morning as we consider the state of this country before the Lord and in his eyes. Romans 1, beginning at verse 18, says this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made, made it evident, evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse." Basically, what that's saying is God's created the universe. It's obvious. You, all you have to do is look around you to see that God is real. The universe is proof. This world, this creation is proof that there is God. And everyone's without excuse because of that. Verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. 
but they became futile, listen, in their thinking, in their speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Same thing that happened to the priests of Israel. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. That's the environmental movement right here. Worshiping the creation, not the creator. For this reason, God gave them over to the degrading passions. For women, for their women, exchanged their natu natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned with... In, uh, and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. The Bible's saying they got so depraved that women began to have homosexual relationships and men began to have homosexual relationships. That's the state of our country today. It's actually celebrated. Verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Now that list that I just read from Romans, I would say that fits or that describes America almost to a T. And these are the times, church, that we are living in today where Men do what is right in their own eyes and give hearty approval to all who practice sin. At this very moment, America is a nation like Persia was, like Babylon before it, like Assyria before that, that is steeped in idolatry. We celebrate sin in every form, and yet so many professing Christians still say that God is... God loves America, that God has blessed America, that God has favor, has found favor with America. If God is not happy with sin and evil, you might ask that same question. Then where's the God of justice? Why hasn't God destroyed America yet? Or maybe this, why hasn't God done anything about it? Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you that he did do something about the pervasiveness of sin. He did. He made a way of salvation to be forgiven of our sin through Jesus Christ. God is not standing idly by and letting the world do what it, it, what it wants without any intervention. God has intervened in the greatest way possible already. He has offered salvation through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ because he knows something. He knows that this world is on a crash course with his judgment. Real, terrifying judgment. And think about this. The Bible says that God is storing up his wrath. He's storing it. What that means is he hasn't forgotten a single sin committed, whether in the mind, the heart, or the action of any man of any era of all of history. God is storing his wrath. He is not foregoing it. He's not saying, I'm not going to bring justice that's what the priests were accusing him of. God is storing it for the day when he will unleash it with a fury that we can't imagine. The book of Revelation paints this terrifying picture of God's judgment in the final days. Brothers and sisters, the only reason America still exists, as well as every other country in the world at this very moment, right now, is because God is abounding in mercy and grace. He is long-suffering and he is patient. He does not love evil and he is not going to stand by idly forever. 
Because as each day marches forward, he is becoming more and more weary of sin, more and more burdened, or more and more fed up. Judgment is coming, and God will not bear the sin of the world forever. That's the point I, wanna, I want us to focus on from Malachi chapter 2, verse 17 this morning. God is not, does not love the wicked, and he is not withholding his justice from them. He is being patient, calling men to be saved until the day. And I want to say this this morning to all of us as we are listening and considering this. It's easy to think about the sins of this nation. It's easy to think about the sins of other people. But I want to ask a question, or actually make a statement rather. You see, God will not bear the sin of the world forever, but God will not bear your sin forever either. Brothers and sisters, I don't know where you, when Jesus is going to return. I'm, I'm, I know about as much about that as you do. But I do know this, all of our days are numbered. And the God of justice will judge this world in righteousness. Every one of us in righteousness. And so how was your walk before the Lord this morning? Last week I said it is very, very important for us to daily consider our walk before the Lord, to daily consider our understanding of our faith. Are we truly followers of Jesus Christ or not? That list that I read earlier of the statistics of what Christians in America believe, do you identify with any of those things? How is your walk before the Lord this day? What condition is your faith in? Some of us may already be Christian, following Jesus Christ. Are you truly following him? Ask yourself that question. Or have you created your own set of standards and rules and regulations to follow that define your version of Christianity? Maybe this. Maybe this. Maybe you're living in a sinful situation right now at this moment. Maybe a sinful lifestyle. Maybe you are doing your best to keep a sin hidden in your life. Are you expecting God's blessing and yet walking in sin and darkness? Brothers and sisters, our eternal soul is not something to be trifled with. And this morning, I'm not bringing this up to, uh, to condemn you, but rather to warn you and to show you God's gift of mercy and grace and forgiveness. Even for those of us who have been following the Lord for a long time, we need to be reminded that sin can creep its way into our lives. And before we know it, it can run wild and wreak havoc in our own lives, in our own personal walk before the Lord. And so I want to plead with you today, plead with you this morning, that if, that if you are living in a sinful lifestyle or situation, or if you have you've some way turned your back on the truth, that God is rich in mercy. He's calling you today to repentance. God does not delight in your, in your wickedness. He does not delight in evil. He delights in truth and righteousness. He delights in us when we walk humbly before him. Because he has set the standard for following him. His truth is absolute and his salvation is only found through Jesus Christ. And the proof of your salvation this morning is not found in your wealth. It is found in the fruit that you are producing in your life. It is found in your obediences to what the Lord has called you to. As Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commands. But it's also found in even more tangible things than just our obedience, which obviously is a very tangible thing. Something we can see, we can feel, we can touch because we're actually doing it. But it's found in uh, the fruits of salvation, which the scriptures tell us are our love. Are you growing in your love? Our joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness and self-control. These are the things that God wants us to produce through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Not sin in waywardness, but righteous living before him. No, I'm not saying that the Bible is calling us to, or, or, or saying that we are going to be perfect. Or I'm even saying this morning that all of us have to be perfect or are not saved. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is consider your walk before the Lord. Confess those sinful lifestyles, those sinful thoughts, those sinful words that are spoken 
those hidden sins that you would rather no one know about. Because a true Christian walk is found when we walk righteously before the Lord. Because the Lord delights in our obedience. And he has favor upon those who are walking in the righteousness of Christ. Not the wicked. He doesn't delight in those. He delights in those who walk faithfully in Jesus Christ. Now some of you perhaps this morning are living apart from Christ altogether. You've never repented. You've never confessed. You've never surrendered your God. Or you're, you're, you've never surrendered yourself to God in any way. Maybe this morning you've totally turned your back on the Lord. You're kind of going through the motions, but you're not truly following him at all. God is calling you back today because of his love. You see, God is withholding his justice, his wrath, until the appointed day so that all of us will have a chance to turn to him. I love what Ezekiel 33, 11 says. Beautiful verse of scripture that truly shows the heart of God. It says this, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. You see, God has no delight in the destruction of the wicked. That's why God hasn't dealt with the world in justice yet. Because his desire is that we be saved. His desire is that we turn to Jesus Christ who died in our place, paid the penalty for our sin so that we might trust in him, walk faithfully with him, and be forgiven of our sin. All of us, Christians this morning, daily walk in repentance, daily grow in your repentance. If you are not Christian this morning, today is the day the Lord is calling you to walk in the truth, to walk in the light. God is rich in love and mercy, even to a country like the United States of America that is living in such wickedness. God still is rich in love and mercy. Is coronavirus the beginning of God's judgment on America? I don't know. I don't know. Can't tell you that. But I do know this. None of us can afford to live our lives in a way where we question and mock God's ways, commands, and judgments. None of us can afford to stand before the creator of the universe without the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And so as we close this morning, it's important for all of us to consider our ways before the Lord. To know that we can have peace with God. It's one of the most incredible promises. It's actually the most incredible promise in the history of the world. That we can have peace with God through repentance and faith. That we can find forgiveness. Even in a country, even in a country that is so wicked as ours. As Jesus said in John chapter 4, the time has come where God is seeking true worshipers, those who will truly follow him. And brothers and sisters, as we continue to grow together in our faith, to encourage one another in the truth, to truly be a Christian church, a beautiful bride of Christ together that God is pleased in, which one of us, I hope all of us, but which of us this morning will respond to this call? To be true worshipers, true followers, to honor God and to speak truth on behalf of him for his name's sake and for the growth of his kingdom. Which of us will respond? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this time together. I pray that you would continue to open our eyes 
to your truth, to your love, to your grace, to the fact, Lord, that you do not delight in the wicked, that, the, that, that, that you are not withholding justice because you delight in the wicked. It's because you delight in the repentance and faith of those who don't know you. And so, Father, you are giving us opportunity. You are giving us chance each and every day to turn to you. We thank you, Father, for your patience, your long-suffering. Teach us, Lord, to walk in faithfulness with you, that we, our ways might be righteous before you, and that we might please you, Lord, in all we say, do, and think. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.